not that I'm not trying to not be out here because believe me, everybody, I don't want to be out here. I know myself, I'm ready to go back indoors. It sucked. You hear people throw out some rude remarks saying, get a job, you filthy bum. It's just something so out of place and it, it scares people. There's got to be a, a, an answer to solve this problem rather than just keep pushing them from neighborhood to neighborhood. They were taking tents. They started pulling our tents up, and whether yeah. we wanted them or not, they yeah. were taking them. They wasn't giving us a chance to get nothing out. And the garbage is the worst, and it smells like feces over there. We've witnessed daily drug use and drug dealing in broad daylight. Housed or houseless, this camping is illegal. I don't want this camp to stay here, though because now my children have been put at risk. They steal stuff off of our porch, out of our yard. They go through our garbage cans. It's not that I feel unsafe in my home. I feel unsafe now leaving my home. The heroin, the house break-ins, the car break-ins. This is not a homeless problem. This is criminal behavior. Why are we seeing so many tents? On any given night, we've got 1,600 or more people sleeping outside. This is a very human and very real and complicated situation. Given a choice tonight, would you rather sleep in a shelter or in a tent? How long have you been in Portland? My opinion, my outlook on things, I really believe that Portland can do a lot better. Portland's always had homelessness, but this is different. The tents, they're visible. They're in your face. Yeah, they are. It seems like they're everywhere, but there are also people living inside those tents. And you know, during this process, we spent time with more than 100 of them. It, it's no way to live. And people are compassionate, yes, but they're frustrated. The tents, the trash, it's changed the look of our town. And it's pretty clear by this point that there's no easy solution. But before we even begin to talk about solutions, we wanted to kind of get to know who's living inside these tents and why. This is the survey that we created. Basic questions, just a few of them, asking about how long these people have been living in tents, why they're living in tents. And really our goal is to go out and talk to these people, people who are living in tents, whether it be on the roadside, in a park, wherever we find them. It's kind of embarrassing sometimes, you know? Because this is the first time I've really been this homeless. So we're going around and we're, we're surveying 100 people living in tents to try and find out more about who these people are. Most of the people are pretty decent out here. You won't find very many that, you know, are heartless and mean. Most of them are really good people. They just have little struggles in their life. Everybody does. You walk out your tent in 10 feet, not even 10 feet, you can touch another tent. Every, every four or five feet, you can touch another tent. There's a lot more tents now than there were before. Well, why do you think that is? People need housing. That's simple, they need housing, they need help. Not everybody can do it by themselves, you know, we're not all able. For all those people who drive by and see your tent, I mean, what what would you want them to know about you? Or what they should they know about you? I'm human, just like them. Just fell down and just need help getting back up, I guess. How long have you been living in a tent? Um, since the 6th of August. Recently then? Yeah. So you've only been on this in a tent for a few weeks. I honestly hate this so much. I wish I could be home. Like I wish I could be in my bed, in my room, able to eat whenever I want, but now I have to walk like at least five to six blocks to eat something or go to the bathroom. It's just, it's really difficult. How long have you been living in a tent? Uh, about a year. This ain't as easy as most people think. It ain't, it ain't, uh, uh, uh. 
not camping. No, it's not. Not even close. <laughs> and I love going camping, and this just ain't it. <laughs> this ain't camping at all. Why do you live in a tent versus other sheltered locations? Because I don't like shelters. They're dirty, they're gross, they're just not sanitary. I mean, I like having my own space and living with my significant other. Shelters, you're not, you can't stay with your significant other. Tents are, it's like my own space, secluded. I can do my own thing. I have my own, I don't have a given amount of certain time where I have to be in somewhere. Um, a shelter, I can't go because of my dogs, and I'm not willing to give my animals up. My animals are like family to me. I'm not willing to give them up for somebody to be in a shelter. This how, spot, how long two been? days here. You've only been in this spot yeah. two, days. two days. Do you expect you can stay for a while? I um, know we'll move on pretty soon. We'll go on down the trail. Mm -hmm. And they'll force you out, or will you voluntarily move? Why, why are you going to move? Um, because we tried to move before the park rangers come. We tried to keep moving on. It's the challenge for these folks. I mean, they don't know necessarily how long they can be in one spot for a certain amount of time before they have to pack up and head somewhere else. So, you know, you talk about insecurity. I think this is part of it. Yeah, it almost seems like this game of cat and mouse where you set up. It is, move. it is, it is. Is that difficult? It is. It's difficult. So where are you going now? Not really sure. Just move to the next spot. Something like that, yeah. We get told to move like every week. So, I mean, even the ones that keep their places clean or whatever, it doesn't matter what you do. We've been finding that a lot of these people, not all of them, but a lot of them, have drug or alcohol problems. Some of them have mental health issues. Honestly, after being out here for a long time, I really believe that like 80% of the people are out here because they want to be. Because they Because be. either it's their choice to live the way they're living or because of drug abuse, that's what they're choosing. Um, but not very many people are like, like really wanting to, like there, there are some, but a lot of people want to be where they're at, I think. They're not ready to make changes. When did you come to Portland? Um, I've lived here my whole life, pretty much. I've lived here my whole life. Whole life? Uh, when I was like four. <laughs> Almost so your whole life. I grew up here. Yeah. The thing I'm finding in talking to these people is they're not coming to town because of opportunity or because there are tents available. These are people who have lived here their entire life or for decades. I mean, they're, they're not newcomers. Given a choice tonight, would you rather sleep here or in a shelter? Uh, probably here. Less people, less headaches. Mm -hmm. I don't do well with people and, yeah. I'd rather sleep in a tent. I'd much rather sleep in a tent, but I'd sure like to have drawers for my socks and things. Probably in a tent. In a tent. Why is that? Because of too many people. <laughs> in shelters. Yeah. Too many people. Yeah. For you, are there other options besides a tent? I mean, are there other places you... <clears throat> You could stay? Um, I don't have any family here. I got my oldest boy, he lives up Polgate here, but he's got five kids of his own. He's got his own family. And I really don't, I don't let on to them to know how I'm not doing that good. Yeah. yeah. As far as tent goes, it's, it's my home. I wish you the best. Thank you. That's the thing, you talk to these people living in tents, they all have a story. Yeah, I mean, it happens every time I walk into a homeless camp. I always meet somebody who grabs me in some way, whether they you know, sort of pull at my heartstrings or they piss me off, they make me happy, they make me frustrated. In this process, I met a woman named Willow who actually let me spend a few days with her. All right, so we're here. It is Wednesday morning. We're here kind of where the Springwater Corridor meets Foster, and we're here to find Willow, when we first met Willow a couple of weeks ago, she was staying where, you know, 205 crosses Woodstock. And she'd been there for a while, but that was ODOT land. And we've covered this a lot. ODOT crews 
came and told her and her friends to move along. So they have now moved to land just next to the spring water corridor. And they said, hey, if you want to come follow us, you have to come here. So we're coming here. We haven't seen their new spot yet. We're going to go find her. And the plan is to pretty much follow her throughout the day. So let's go do it. Willow has told us where she'd be. Anybody back here? But it's not exact. You can see here we're kind of getting into the parts of the corridor that are more brush covered. And there's a chance she could have had to move again. It happens a lot. Hey guys, I'm really sorry to bother you. We're with Channel 8. We're looking for Willow. We find her and her camp. No one else wants to be on camera. Yeah, is everything okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting for my my to come back. So okay. We okay. meet around a corner. Hey, Willow. And right away, we're walking. We are crossing we cross over that way. Healed in a... Willow's dog Luna has an eye infection. Taking her to the vet will be no quick trip. It's crazy. I forget how industrial of an area this is. Translation, she says, nothing out here is easy. This last winter was really harsh. On the way, we learn about Willow's life. And I love my kids. She talks of her two grown kids. They're the best thing I've ever done in my life. And the husband she lost to leukemia. She was 29. We had been together for 14, 15 years. After that, her life and her business in California and, uh, collapsed. I just couldn't stay there because everything reminded me of it. That is one reason Willow is homeless. The other? She's epileptic. Weekly seizures leave her tired and confused. She lives off of disability, roughly $700 a month. I mean, it would take all of my check to, to pay rent. Yeah. And then I would have nothing to live on at all. 10 a.m., we're at the max stop. I'll be right back. Break time. I got a brand new pair of rooms. You got a brand new key. I think that we should get together. Try them out to yeah. see. It's, it's, it's crazy to think about. All she's trying to do is get eye cream for her dog. Her dog's had this eye infection on and off for a year. And she blocked out four hours of her day for this one errand. For most of us, we take our dog to the vet, maybe an hour, hour and a half, you can do it on your lunch break. For her, this is her day. And it might not even work because it depends on if the clinic has time. We're riding the Green Line North. This route is familiar. Yeah, this bridge coming up is where, where we stayed. Um, when I first, when I was first homeless, Willow's been homeless in Portland for almost a decade. How many would you say were staying under there? About five to nine. Five to nine? Yeah. Is there a point where it's so many people in one spot that it can get kind of crazy? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, it is. Like, it's the spring water corridor. There are so many people that it's like never quiet. Yeah. Here, Mena. We get off at 82nd Avenue and walk to the Portland Animal Welfare Team. That's a nonprofit that provides free vet care. I told him it was because of the Most days you need an appointment. We don't have one. And you go by primarily by Willow. Willow, correct? yeah. Staff ask Willow for ID. That's a problem. My, my backpack was just stolen not too long ago. <laughs> and, and most of, fortunately, I didn't, I kept my, my picture ID and my uh, phone case, but all the rest of my ID and that stuff was in there. We hear that a lot. Many living outside don't have any IDs. They've been lost or stolen. Without those, getting a job, an apartment, or a replacement is next to impossible. Today, Willow is out of luck. Luna, her eye pink and swollen, won't be seen by a doctor. Would you be able to come back for an appointment next Wednesday, the 23rd? We right. head out. So they said to come back in a week? Yeah, yeah, next Wednesday. Is that frustrating to you or is that okay? No, it's fine. It's great. At least she's going to be taken care of. Yeah. I'll just keep cleaning it out with the, because I have a wash, an eye wash. Next, on to another nonprofit. It's called Join. Willow gets her mail there and her disability check is due. I stayed underneath the Max um, train. As we walk, we hear stories of how cruel people can be to campers. One woman, was ruthless. She said, well, at least I worked and I didn't lay on my back like you did, unlike you or something like that. <laughs> like, like she was referring that I was a prostitute or something. <laughs> and, How and does that hit you as a woman? I mean, well, it's a little frustrating, you know, people that people prejudge. 
at join, Willow goes in. Yeah, I'll take some food. Minutes later, back out. Come on, baby, I know it's hot, come on. And we walk away, empty handed. That check is late, it happens. Well, one time it was like six days late. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, if your rent is six days late or if your other bills. We get back on the train, still talking of money. There are a couple people that do have jobs. Right. Yeah. But something is changing. Pauses are lingering. Epilepsy is taking over. It's, um, I'm, I'm having um, like a little bit of an absence seizure could think that I told you about before and um, I can't think straight. An absence seizure, blank cloudy periods that can hit out of nowhere. Yeah, I think I'm going to go in and go home and take a pill and lay down under a tree or something. Willow's afraid a full blown seizure is coming next. You want to just kind of chill and so we agree to stop the interview. But remember, we still have to get back to camp. It's a long walk. We take it slow. Willow insists she'll be okay, but her day is done. That night, Willow had that full-blown seizure, the kind that leaves her exhausted and confused. The next day, Cruz ordered her group to move again. It doesn't matter that Willow is tired. Life on the streets goes on. I hear versions of Willow's story time and time again from people living in tents. They're all complicated stories and they don't have a clear path forward. Well, and one common thread we've heard from people living in tents, yeah. they've been here for years, but now suddenly we're seeing all these tents. Yeah. So what's changed? Homeless camps, crime, and trash in the Lentz neighborhood as people who live there asking the city for help. Neighbors have found their car windows smashed, their garbage ransacked. Neighbors in Lentz have had it with a seemingly endless cycle. Homeless camps get booted just to settle down. I've been a lot of places and I've never seen it like this ever. Portland is the worst. They steal stuff off of our porch, out of our yard. They go through our garbage cans. We've witnessed daily drug use and drug dealing in broad daylight. People exposing themselves, defecating, urinating. I'm Sergeant Randy Tighe. I work with the East Precinct Neighborhood Response Team. And from my perspective, it just slowly grew. And, and then it was like, I went down the trail one day and went, what the, what just happened out here? Well, why do you think tents, why has that created such conflict? I mean, yeah, I think what it is, it's just a symbol of disorder. And um, I think that our communities are not designed to support that. And when you see it, it's just something so out of place and it, it scares people. I just think it's that simple. It's just not normal. And um, tents in a campground, normal. You know, uh, tents in, uh, along a bike path, not. So at what point did we open the floodgates and people really begin setting up tents? I think uh, probably at the end of 2014, things started getting uh, rapidly, uh, depending on your perspective, getting worse or more people. That's around the time that Portland was implementing rules required by a federal lawsuit known as Anderson versus the city of Portland. It would totally change the way the city deals with homeless, especially police. They had to post a notice at least 24 hours in advance of moving a camp. Camps couldn't be cleared at night, and police had to catalog and store any confiscated property. It protected the legal rights of campers, yes, but it slowed down the process of moving troublesome camps. My name is Mark Jolin. I'm the director of the Joint Office of Homeless Services. Do we allow people to live in tents? So that is a harder question to answer because on the one hand, it's, it's not lawful to set up structures in the right of way. On the other hand, if someone sets up a tent who is homeless, they have some protections in place under legal settlements that have been um, entered into over the years. We've always had homelessness. We've had some tents, right? But now there's just a uh, uh, much greater number of tents. So what's changed? So there are a couple of things driving that. Um, to some extent, you know, we, we have this 
concentration of folks who are struggling with disabilities and are sleeping outside and, and don't don't have options right now and, and they're gravitating towards tents and um, and there are fewer kind of out of the way places anymore for folks to go um, if, they, if they're gonna be in a tent. So that that's mattered. This is by far the single issue that we hear the most about. And virtually every one of the hundreds of calls we get every week starts like this. I'm a compassionate person, but. Homelessness has always been an issue here though. Why is it, what is it about the tents that brings out this level of conflict and this, um, this dynamic from the community? You know, our, our city has been inconsistent and I would even argue ineffective in addressing the tent issue, focusing narrowly on that. Uh, for a number of years we weren't even enforcing overnight camping codes. We have to manage the problem as we move them more quickly into housing. That's the goal. It was called the safe sleep policy and a lot of people to sleep in small groups, in tents, or on sidewalks during the evening hours. But the policy created a lot of confusion. It gave Portland's homeless free reign to spend the night undisturbed in tents or sleeping bags on city sidewalks. But yes, Portland group Mayor has Charlie had Hale. enough of Mayor Charlie Hale's advocates, But they say the mayor's camping policy, which allows the homeless to sleep on the sidewalks and pitch their tents in public places, is actually doing more harm than good. And they say, That process sort of kicked off a real shift on the ground around people where they chose to locate with tents and and it, it the level of confusion it created and the challenges around creating real accountability on the ground for the choices people were making led to, to sort of a proliferation of, of tents in places we hadn't historically seen them. They became much more concentrated in, in a lot of situations. Did Mayor Hale's policy create confusion? I mean, was there misperception? Yes. Yeah, it created a lot of confusion. I mean, it was Officers did not know what they were allowed to do. This, this becomes a, a, a legal quagmire, basically. So it gets, starts getting very complicated. And I just don't think that when he did that policy that he anticipated that problem. I think they're, they're not doing nothing about it. I think there, there's nothing, and um, there's no law saying we can't put a tent up, is there? Charlie Hales wasn't around for an interview, but he sent an email and said, arguing about safe sleep is a sideshow at best. He pointed out that cities up and down the West Coast are dealing with the same issue, homelessness and tents. Portland's homeless situation, while it is dire, I'm not making any excuses, it is dire, the reality is our homeless situation is not as severe as it is in Seattle, San Francisco, LA, or other cities up and down the West Coast. We don't believe camping in a tent is a humane alternative to living in a warm, dry place with access to water, access to showers, access to laundry, and access to social services that can actually help people get out of homelessness. Do you foresee a day when there are no tents visible on the streets of Portland? I, I, th I think that has to be our goal in the sense that if we didn't have any tents on the streets of Portland, it would mean that we had figured out how to you know, scale our shelter and our housing programs to the level where everyone who found themselves with no better option in the moment had a better option. Our goal was not to solve this problem, yeah. but to better understand it. Right, remember we wanted to figure out how we got here and who's living inside these tents. Yeah. Because clearly there's no easy solution here, but maybe this is a step in the right direction. If nothing else, it might be a step in understanding the complexity of this problem. And again, just recognizing these are real people. They become invisible to a lot of people, people that just do not want to look in that direction. Spend a week in my shoes. It's not as easy as most people think. And they can start oh, lazy bastards on No, it's a little more to it than that. And they look at us like a zoo animal. Just because we're homeless, it doesn't mean we're all bad. I mean, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And I wish people around us would care a little bit more.